Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon, Ma. Uh, thank you for joining us, Ma. Yes, <laughs> I've really been missing Ma. all this well. I've been missing all this well. I'm, I thank God I have the opportunity doctor. to join you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we want to say a big thank you to family members who have joined us early. I, I, I presume that others will join. And so without further ado, we are starting off because we said four will be four. So our program coordinator says she's trying to co uh, connect while waiting for her, we will kick off. She will join us. Okay, so let's start with a short word of prayer. Let's start with a short word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we appreciate you for this opportunity. We thank you for a time like this because you are God and you have ordained this period to empower us, to open our eyes to possibilities. Father, we pray that you come and reign from the beginning till the end in the name of Jesus. We commit all our devices into your hands, O oh Lord, from the Zoom app to our data connection, to our laptops, our phones, they will all work for us and not against us in the name of Jesus. We pray our electricity will work for us in the name of Jesus. We commit all the speakers into your hands, Father, that you will speak through them, Lord, that through them you will touch our lives for good. Father, we bless your name because DMM 7.0 is already blessed. Take all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Okay, so I want to start by talking about why we started the DMM program. Uh, to the glory of God, I've been in the digital marketing space for 20 years, precisely this year. I started in 2003. And so this year makes it 20 years that I've been in the digital marketing space. At the time, it wasn't called digital marketing. It, it, then we called it internet marketing, IM. So it was much later that the term digital marketing came in and we latched onto it. And, you know, for, for me, curiosity was what drew me to the internet because I was like, when I was in secondary school, we had pen pals and we will send them messages through posts. It, it could take a month, sometimes two months before they will reply. But this was a technology through which I could reach people in minutes, in seconds. And so that curiosity drew me to the internet. And I realized that I could actually make a living out of it. And we bless God for how far we have come. And so in about a few, some few years ago, I just started having this burden to share the knowledge I've gained over the years to also get people who can empower our young people. And we thank God that we have done the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and this is the seventh edition. We thank God for how far he has brought us. And so basically that is the rationale behind this program. The rationale basically is to bridge the digital skills gap among our youth in Nigeria and Africa. And we thank God that we are doing our bit and we know he will grow from here. We will not be at the same spot, we will move up and up and up. And so we will quickly go to 
our program for the day so that our first speaker can get on to the stage. Okay, so according to our program, we have a, okay, we have Oluwani Femi Ayodele to talk to us about the business of academic writing. And so I'll introduce her and she will take the floor. Ayodele Oluwani Femi Beula is a highly skilled research writer, ghost writer, and content writer with a wealth of experience spanning over four years. Holding a BSc in food science and technology from the esteemed Federal University of Agriculture, Abel Kuta, she possesses a unique perspective and deep expertise that greatly enhances her writing prowess. Currently, Ayodele Oluwani Femi Beula serves as a research writer and editor at Mindmark Agency, where she consistently delivers exceptional quality work. Additionally, she is a research partner at Peacock Research Agency and also contributing her expertise at Research Centra. These roles exemplify her commitment to producing outstanding research-driven content. As the esteemed team lead of Afri Rights, a vibrant community of African writers, Ayodele Onu Anifemi is dedicated to fostering creativity and amplifying diverse voices within the writing sphere. She wholeheartedly promotes self-development and career growth and remains an ardent follower of the gospel of Christ. In addition to her accomplishments in the writing world, Ayodele Oluwani Femi Beula is also an author with her latest novella titled, I Was Ugly for Four Years, garnering significant engagement surpassing 200 plus readers. Her compelling storytelling captivates audiences and leaves a lasting impact. Ayodele Oluwani Femi Beula combines her extensive experience, academic background and commitment to personal and professional growth to produce remarkable written content that resonates with readers and inspires others in the writing community. We warmly welcome Oluwani Femi to the House of Wisdom platform to teach us the business of academic writing. You are welcome, my sister. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, you are welcome. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Yabo, for the introduction. I really, really, really find this as a privilege coming to discuss on this platform this evening. And um, I want to say thank you for having me. I want to hope that everyone can hear me, you can see me wherever you are. And um, we're going to have, have just a few minutes of discussion and then there'll be question and answer for us to interrogate on whatever I am going to, or whatever I have, I was, I have said, or whatever I'm going to be saying. And just like Mrs. Iabo said, I am going to be talking on the business of academic writing. And um, just like the topic is the business of academic writing. So basically I'm going to be teaching us on two different things. Now, let me break the topic down a little bit. We're going to be talking briefly on academic writing and then we're going to be talking on the business i mean how to make an income or a revenue out of academic writing so if you are with me and you are ready for me this evening can you just drop an emoji in the comment section drop an emoji i'm going to check in i just want to see us i just want to know that we are following me in the chat box just just say something drop something Emoji, whatever, just drop something. All 
All right, all right, all right. Thank you so much. So very quickly, we are going to be going to the business of the day so we don't waste our time. Academic writing, not like every other writing, is a niche in writing. Now, I would not want to go into too many details, but I want us to know that there are many, actually, there are many niche in writing. There is SEO writing, there is academic writing, there is um, blog writing, there is creative writing. There's a lot of writing. Writing spans through a lot. Like, there are a lot of niche, a lot of specialization in writing. But today we're going to be talking on research writing, academic writing. That is what we're going to be concentrating on today. And so, just like every other type of writing, it is a niche writing. But the difference is that it's, it is specialized on research and the world of academics, the world of academia, the world of, of yes, that's just it. It's in the world of academics, the world of research. That is the major, that is what we are majoring on. We are not looking out of, we are not looking to creativity. We are not looking at any other thing. What we are concentrating on is the world of academics and research. And that is why it is coined as research writing. Now, I wrote here in my book, I said, just like any other form of writing, it requires its specialization and expertise, which can only be accumulated with time. Now, as much as we're going to be talking in this few minutes, I am not going to be diving so much into the old techniques of academic writing, because it is not something that I can break down in 30 minutes or in just a few minutes. It is a lot, but I'm going to be giving us some basics that so that you can build up on those things that I'm going to be saying, and then you can start hopefully, you can start a career in research writing or academic writing. But don't forget that I said that it takes time. You don't become a guru or anything in a day. So it takes time to actually become the best that you can be in research writing. Now, I will just say a few things about academic writing or research writing. Number one, academic writing revolves around the following things I'm going to be saying. I have six points that I noted down and I'm going to be running through it in some few minutes. Number one, it revolves around academic, reflect, academic reflections. Now, when you hear academic writing or research writing, what, one of the things that should come to your mind is that you are doing academic reflections. Now we have times that you can get to, um, you get people saying that, okay, can you, you want the subject. Now I'm not bringing them plain terms and not try to exaggerate or do some grammatical, um, I, I don't want to say too many grammars. I want to bring it in ABC terms so that we can actually understand what I'm trying to say. So now let me use an example. If you are a science student, or let's say that you, you are just a student in any university or any college or high school that you find yourself in. And let's say you did a topic on, um, let me look for a topic now. Let's say you did a topic on maybe technological advancement in the 21st century and your lecturer or your teacher or your educator has done a lot teaching you on several things related to the topic. It can, he or she can just ask you that, okay, now we've successfully finished this course or we've successfully finished this um, stuff. Now, can you give, and the person asks you questions now, okay, can you give a reflection of what you've learned this past two weeks? And then what you just need to do is articulately give them a report on what was taught. It is a form of research writing. It's a form of academic writing. Now, there are very, there are different forms and there are plenty of things that it still revolves around. That's just one of it. Now, the second one is that application of academic knowledge to relatable issues. Now, one thing I want us to know is that as many of us, many of us are on this call, we've actually passed through school one way or the other. And a lot of these things that I'm going to be saying, the things we did then, 
were things that we did then minimally or just we did and we don't really know that we can end half of these things. We can actually we can actually actually build a living, build a stream of income out of these things. But we don't know. We just did it then for doing sake or whatever. Now, just like I was saying in my second point, application of academic knowledge to relatable issues. Now, let me use a very practical example. Now, let's say that you did a course on electric cars, I mean, Tesla and all of that. And after doing it, they now ask you that, okay, let's say you are an engineer or let's say you are an innovator and in the next few years, you want to do something. Let's say you just did something on technology and then someone is asking you that, Imagine you want to innovate a new product. Imagine you want to innovate a new type of car or a new species of electric cars. With the stuff you've learned about electric cars, can you try to bring expertise or whatever you've learned, can you try to put it together and see how you're going to apply it into your own innovation and let's see what you can bring out of it. So you will just have to sit down Tell us the things you learned during the course of the lectures or whatever you learned, and then say something like, okay, we did this, and then if my own innovation on electric cars is going to be like this, then just like this and this method, or you say just like this framework, just like this methodology, I will do this, I will apply this, I will apply this, I will apply that. Application of academic knowledge to relatable issues. Let me run through the third one fast because of time. Communication of academic knowledge on a particular subject or topic, almost related to what I explained the previous one. Now, I told you I'm going to say six things that academic writing revolves around. I'm going to quickly give you a recap. Number one is academic reflections. Number two is application of academic knowledge to relatable issues. Now, you are trying to relate what you have learned something that is not really academic in nature, but what you've learned during the course of a course or whatever it is, how can you apply it to? Now, let me give you another practical example for that one. Let's say that you learned on human relations. And then your workers are not coming to work because of the a problem or a complaint, and then it is reducing the the company's um, income, and then it, it just as a way is affecting the complaint. What can you? What solutions can you prefer, or what do you think that the company can do to actually um, combat that? problem and then you know at that point you are not supposed to come and be telling us what you learned in school you are coming to tell us how you can apply what you learned in the school or what you learned in class to that issue okay you can say that okay employees are not coming because of this reason because of this reason based on this theory which states this then we can as the hr i am going to do this or i'm going to apply this theory and then you know maybe the theory says that you investigate the workers maybe you have to talk to them maybe you have to do something application now the third one i'm going to be talking about very quickly is communication of academic knowledge on a particular subject now this one is that you are just going to be communicating your academic knowledge on a subject maybe you're trying to tell us what you know academically about corona so you can make me maybe have a client that, and this is how we deal with academic, like I mean, the, the old academic writing, this is what it entails. This is what it revolves around. All right, I'm seeing a notification here that somebody cannot hear me. Can we all hear me? Please, if you can hear me, just say yes in the, in the chat box. I don't know why that notification popped up. But it's saying that someone cannot hear me. Okay, you can hear me. Very good. I'm going to just run through. So if you are the person that can't hear me, please, I just hope you fix that because of time. Okay, the first one I'm going to be talking about is research and scientific recommendations. Now, after you, when you are writing or you are doing anything in regards to academic writing, you're not just there to come and give us a lot of things. At the end of your writing, you must be able to recommend something for future 
in interrogations on that topic, you must be able to say something that every other person that is going to actually take up that research or continue in the line of that research in future will be able to work based on what you've recommended. You can just say that, okay, with this thing I have done, I can say that um, it's just like you're saying that, okay, I have done my part, but if there's any other person that is coming to do the same thing, this is what you should do. So everything that you are, for anybody that is going to be here and going to be building a career in academic writing or research writing later in the future, I want you to know that at the end of everything you're writing, if you don't have a recommendation, you are not written well. You are still lagging somewhere or somehow. So let me go to the fifth one that I have here. And that says analysis of academic knowledge Okay, analysis of academia knowledge and accuracy. Now, one thing that research writing is going to tell or we're going to ask about or we require from you is a test of your academic knowledge. Whether you're writing for a client or you're writing for personal, personal use or whatever it is, it is going to test your knowledge academically. How sound are you in that subject? How well do you know what you are talking about? How well do you know what you are criticizing on? How well do you know what you are analyzing? How well do you know what you are describing academically? And you have to support it with a lot of literatures. And that's what I said earlier. It is It revolves around everything academics, and academics alone. So whatever you are saying, for everything that every point you are going to be making in academic writing, you have to support it with literature. So you cannot give your point and and then your point is just there and you want to lecture to feel that you know it, you or you, you there's nothing you are saying that it's that was not formed or um formulated by somebody. Somebody actually got that. Somebody was the one that described it. Somebody was the one that gave that definition. It is not you. So it is not new. So you have to reference and cite whatever you are doing such that it shows that you are academically grounded and you know what you are saying. Now, the sixth one I have here is academic writing revolves around the level of academic precision on subject matter. Let me say that again. Academic writing revolves around the level of precision, of academic precision on a subject matter. Now, it's just almost the same thing about what I just said earlier on citations, referencing. One way you can actually prove of your level of academic precision is that you always reference and you always cite that, okay, this person has said this. One person named someone like this has done something like this or has done a project on this thing before. And this is what the person got. So it actually shows that you have academic knowledge and you are precise. So your lecturer can just decide to, to all, the lecturer of your clients can decide to go through what you said, the journals that you cited, and the person will find what you said in that journal. So the person can be sure that you do not just fabricate things, you are grounded academically. So those are the six things that academic writing revolves around. So let me just give a quick recap. Number one, I said academic reflections. Number two, application of academic knowledge to relatable issues. Number three, communication of academic knowledge on a particular subject or topic. Number four, research and scientific recommendations. And number five, analysis or critical evaluation of academic knowledge and accuracy. And number six, level of academic decision on a subject matter. Now, let me quickly run through the types of academic or research writing that we have. Now, there are several forms of um, academic writing. We have four major forms of academic writing. The moment Descriptive, number two, analytical, number three, critical, and number four, persuasive. Now, let me just um, do a brief explanation on what this type of academic writing is. Number one, descriptive. Now, you're just describing academically, you're describing something, you're describing a subject matter. The second one, analytical, you are actually like you are, you are giving us the intent, like you are giving, let us see the, how would I put it down? You're not just describing things on a surface level. You are, you are breaking it down into the in-depth of it. Like, okay, you're going through, the, just like someone explaining risk management now, and then you start from the risk itself. 
you start telling us the type of risk that it, maybe someone is asking you to write something on risk management in the companies, and then you don't just describe. Now, if you want to describe, you could not have told us what risk management is all about and how companies um, engage risk management. You understand? But when it comes to anal analyzing it and becoming analytical about it, you define risk. You break it down. Okay, what are the type of risks? How does risk affect organizations? Now, you can even go ahead to explain how each type of risk that an organization can face, how this type of risk can affect the organization. Okay, financial risk, this is how it can affect the organization. Credit risk, this is how it can affect the organization. Um, what type of risk can we have? Well, safety risk, this is how it can well, 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 a brass, a breakdown of everything that you are going to be explaining that is that is analytical when it comes to the critical aspect at the critical aspect of an of academic writing you begin to criticize or will i say you begin to analyze different journals you are starting to tell us that okay michael et al said this about risk management but but when they at all 2021 also said this then you begin to you begin to um, see between Bodunde's point of view or uh, Bodunde's perspective and Michael's perspective. Oh, how do they correlate? What is the uh, what is the similarities between them? What is the differences between them? And all of those things. So at that point, you're not just um, describing, you're not just analyzing. You begin to criticize between people's point of view, between scholars' point of view, between scholars' perspective about the subject matter. And the last one, persuasive then, this time, in the persuasive type or in the persuasive form of view, you are going to um, try to convince your readers about a, a subject matter or about your own pers perspective about or your, I mean, your own scientific perspective or your own um, scientific knowledge about what you're talking about, about what you are describing. So at that point, you are not just trying to criticize, but you have your point of view that you're trying to drive. You have a point of view that you're trying to, how would I put it? You're trying to make it acceptable to your listeners or to your set of readers. So and I must state that this forms of right of research writing that I just talked about, these types, it is not just solely used. Now you don't just say that okay, in a writing I want to do, I want to use just descriptive no, no, they are used interwovenly. Sometimes you can even use the four, you can even use the four of it. Sorry about that. You can use the four of it in a particular piece that you are writing. And sometimes it can be two, sometimes it can be one. It's majorly combinations of all the types of writing. So we are going to be moving very quickly now to the way you can end using, uh, from academic writing, in case you want to do the career in academic writing, how you can end from academic writing. So I want to know if we are still with me. So just please just say something or just comment in the chat box so I know that we are actually here. All right, so we're going to be moving very quickly to building an income stream from academic or research writing. Now, number one thing, if you are going to build an income from academic writing or research writing, number one is that you must be diligent with your expertise. Now, I used to say something to us, many that want to listen to me. The writing space is now becoming very, very competitive. You cannot compare the way writing was in some years back to the way it is now. It is now very, very competitive. All right, sorry, can we hear me, please? Yes, yes. yes very well. Very loud and clear. Right. Yes, okay. we are hearing you. All right. So I was saying that the academic space is becoming very, very competitive. That you cannot afford to be a 
you can't afford to not up your game. If you're going to end from something, I used to tell my, my, my reflecting mentees in academic writing or maybe people that I teach, I tell them something. See, anybody that trusts you with their money is expecting you to deliver nothing but quality. And one thing is that people used to say, and this is just the truth, that first impression lasts longer. See, if you're going to think about monetizing anything, don't think about the money first. The first thing that you should think about is, if I do something for somebody once, would the person trust me enough to come back? That's the thing. Once the person can come back, you, you want a client already. So be very, very diligent to your expertise. Know what you are doing and do it right. If you need to spend months, I'm saying this first because it is the base of everything else I am going to be saying. If you need to spend months building your expertise so that you can be good at what you are doing, please spend it. Take your time to, to be what you're supposed to be. Take your time to learn. Take your time to grow. Don't rush into it because you want to end. If your mindset is ending at the first place, you might end up, um, I would like you end up doing some things that you would have to now start buying your 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 perception or your you know your impression back. And it's it's a lot. People don't see it is very hard to impress people the second time, especially when you have not impressed them the first time. Because even when you are doing it for the second time, they will feel like okay, you are doing it because you failed them the second time. So they are doing you are doing it because you want them to have it good perspective about you but, it, but when you can make someone good at you make someone feel good about you at the first time see even when you fail the second time and when you fail the third time they they there's a kind of way they feel that oh, it was just a mistake and they, there's kind of way they just wants to give you they want to give you a second chance that's the way that's the way it is actually so just like i was saying be, be, be diligent with your expertise whatever you are doing do it and do it well I know it is for the money's sake, but do it like it's your life. Do it like you. that is your source of living. Number two is build a portfolio. I cannot emphasize this enough. You cannot be a writer and not have a portfolio because the world is the, the way this world is going through now. You anybody that wants to, any prospective client that is coming to you, the first thing they're just saying is where is where's your portfolio? So before they can even go further in questioning you or maybe interrogating you for anything. They will only come back to interrogate you when they've gone through your portfolio and they feel like you have something that they can work with. So it is simple. Reading your portfolio is simple. Gather all your samples. And one thing I used to tell newbies, if you're just right, if you're just starting out as a writer and you don't have you don't have uh, maybe uh, past works that you've done or anything, find time, do some writing on your own. As if you are doing it for client, look for subject topics that you can write on right or needs, so that you have something you can show people when you are asked to showcase your work. So you don't just say, ah, I am a good writer, but I don't have evidence. Portfolio is an evidence to showcase your expertise. So when I'm asking you for your portfolio, you don't have anything to show to me. You are just telling me that you don't have anything to offer. So it's very simple. We have uh, Medium, we have clippings.me. You can use, we have Google Docs. As a writer, you can use Google Docs to build a portfolio. It should be just writing. It is just writing. Put all your documents together in one place. Create a file for it. Um, copy the link. So whenever you are asked for your portfolio, just send the link to the person and the person can go through your work. And sometimes I do advise, especially if you are using Google Doc for your portfolio, try to restrict the way people can edit it because the world is, the world is, let me use the word, the world is crazy. You can be very surprised that somebody can go and take your work and then be claiming that it is their work. So do it in a way, set the settings in, in such a way that even if people are going through your work, they can't, they can't copy it. They can't plagiarize. They can't copy your work and start claiming it is their own. Number three, network. Network people and be very big on networking with the right circle. Now, hear that very well. I did not just say network. I said network with people and be very, very big on networking with the right circle. Now, a lot of people just have the mindset of networking. Okay, I will go to, I will go for events. I will go for this. I will go for that because I want to network. It's another thing to network. It's another thing to network with the right people. I said, I wrote something in my book here. I said, don't just build a network of people. 
but a network of the right people. The right people that can push you from where you are now to where you want to be. The right people that can accelerate your, your journey in whatever you are hoping to do the career in. So just with a set of people that they don't even understand anything about what you are doing. <laughs> just imagine you being a writer and your, everybody you have around you are photographers, graphic designers, you are UX, you are UX guys, tech guys, tech bros, and nobody even around you, there's nobody around you that you can have a problem and you can just, you know, share it with, the, okay, I'm trying to work on this subject and I don't know how to break it down or how to analyze it. How do you think I should go about it? And the person will be able to say, okay, take it from this angle, talk about this, talk about that, then then do it like this, do it like this. You don't have anybody like that around you and you say that you have networked. With. No, you have actually built a you've been, you've been, you've been successful on building a set of people around you but i don't feel that they are still the right people for you because you need somebody that can be able to help you see your mistakes help you see your errors and help you become better at what you are doing not just help you become better but help you become better at what you are doing now i'm not saying you don't have friends that are not doing what that they are not doing what do but it's very important that as much as you also have friends have friends that do what you do do the network of people that do what you're doing so that when you are wrong they can correct you and you can you can actually fly on the wing of their own experience on the wing of their own expertise i say something most times when i'm writing or when i have a particular work of a client i'm stuck on i just have to give some people some calls i'll just be like see bro see guy i have something i'm working on right now and i'm stuck just let me go through this work let me know where i'm missing it let me know what i need to work on all right so i need to round up now so the first, first one I have here is have the tech bro or tech sis mindset. Now, what do I mean is that embrace technology and artificial intelligence. However, do not boycott the process with artificial intelligence. Now, I wish I could explain more of that, but I'll just I'll just say that please, as much as you're embracing technology, if you are going to be doing anything under research writing, don't boycott the process with AI. Number five have a mentor early have a mentor have somebody that is in the field that can mentor you number six own your soft skills like sharpen your soft skills soft excel expertise emotional intelligence I, I, I think I mentioned a lot already. Please, let me just run through it again. Communication, value pricing, interpersonal relationship, people management skill, time management, MS word efficiency, Excel expertise, and emotional intelligence. And the last one I have here is build your brand. Now, the best way to build a brand nowadays, as a, as a writer, especially when you do things that has to involve online, is have a very strong online presence. If you are still somebody that is thinking that, okay, I don't need to be online, you're missing it. I am missing out. Have a very strong online presence. Push your expertise to people. Let people know what you're doing and what your self goal, what your brand goal, what everything that we Uh, Nifami seems to be having some sort of uh, network issue, but I believe uh, we, Ben, can you hear me? Okay. I, she seems to be having some network issues and uh, I think we should be putting our questions in the chat box for her to answer. Please, let's have your questions in the chat box so she can sort them out once she can 
get through that. Let's have your questions in the chat box, please. If you have questions as regards all that she has shared, please let us know. And if you want to ask the question personally, you are free to just raise up your hand and let's have your question. If we don't have questions, we will have to move on to the next speaker on our program. Okay, so our, our next speaker is, let me just check our program that we shared. So, okay, so our next speaker is Adepo Wale Belo. And he will be talking to us about how to leverage the opportunities in health writing. He is a health writer, so he'll be able to do justice to that. But before he takes the floor, I want to say some things about him. Adebo Ale Belo is a final year student of microbiology and a health writer with two years of experience. He started writing health content for his department in school, gradually improved himself, and is steadily working on building his personal brand on LinkedIn as a health writer. He has written on a, a wide variety of health topics for reputable brands like Semic Health and Deadline Health Africa. And that is what I tell our people that even while in school, some of these remote uh, jobs you can do. He's still in school and he's taking advantage of this opportunity. And so we warmly welcome Adepo Wale to the House of Wisdom platform to teach us how to leverage the opportunities in health writing. You have the floor, Adepo Wale. Hello. Yes, you have the um, floor. Okay, thank you. I would like to share my screen, please. Can I go ahead? Go ahead and share your screen. Yes, I already enabled it. Okay. Thank you and um, good evening. Ooh, to, to begin without wasting much time, as time is far gone, We'll be discussing health writing and how you can leverage the opportunities in health writing. So um, to begin with, I believe most of us are familiar with reputable health applications which we use, such as the Google Fit, Samsung Health, and several others. And for these applications, they are a function of the health tech industry, a function of the health tech industry. And, um, okay, let me hold on, please. Okay, yeah, there we have it. Yeah, so without further ado, what is health writing? Health writing is a subset of medical writing. Now there's a difference between health writing and medical writing. Health writing is like a younger brother to medical writing. Medical writing involves things like medical journalism, medical education, that's where health writing falls in. And we have things like regulatory writing and also research writing. So, Health writing is a subset of medical writing. And with the increase in health awareness these days, there has been an increase for the need for accurate health content. And also with the increase in digital tools, if you are a female, you should be familiar with the Flow app, the Flow Health app. And um, if you are a gym, a gym person, you could use the Google Fit or the calorie counter, which could help you 
um, manage your calories. So with the increase in all these digital tools, there is a need for more health writers who can create accurate health content, which is why we are discussing what exactly health writing is. Now, health writing involves creating content about health and medical topics for the general public. Health writing basically is you writing for the public. Let me give you an example. Let's say you want to check out what malaria is and you go to the internet and type, what is malaria? The results you see on the search engine are content, articles written by someone who is a health writer. So, and you would notice that when you click on any of those links, when you check any of those articles, they are written in such a way that even though you are not a health professional, you can understand what they wrote. So that also moves us then to health writing being the way of communicating health information in a clear way. If you write content as a health writer and your reader who is not a health professional cannot understand what you've written, then you failed to, to reach that reader. You failed to pass your point across. So health writing is basically simplified writing of health content. And because you are writing for the general public, you need to have a sufficient knowledge of what you are writing about. And most times people who are in the health writing field are people who have health background, um, people who are medical doctors, biochemists, pharmacists, nurses, but don't let that deter you. If you are not in the health niche, you can still get involved in health writing. And we'll discuss that as we go ahead. And now since health writing is a dynamic field, it is a field that Every day there are new researches being made, there are new trends, there are new things that we have to follow up on. It would need you as a health writer or as a potential health writer to have the ability to make a lot of research. One, to understand the research you are making. Two, and to be able to communicate this complex research in a clear and concise manner. Three, so first, ability to make research. Secondly, ability to understand the research you've made. And finally, to be able to communicate this research in a way that a layman understands. As a health writer, also you get involved in writing several pieces of content. You can write blog posts, you can write articles, you can write white papers and also um, leaflets and other educational materials. Probably you go to the hospital and all these flyers are being um, given out. Those flyers are written in a way that you can understand. They are written in a way that once you go through it and even see the visuals there, you have a clear idea of what they are trying to pass across. So moving on, what do you need to become a health writer? Basically, you need to have some certain things already which would help you in becoming a health writer. That moves us to our first point, which is a health background. Like you can see on the screen there, it is preferred, but it is not compulsory. There are people who studied law, who studied banking and finance, who studied several other courses, but who write health content. So that shows that a health background is not compulsory, you do not have to be in the health niche to write health content. Though, if you're in the health niche, it gives you an extra advantage. Why? It gives you an extra advantage because you're already familiar with the medical terminologies being used in the health niche. So you are familiar with these terms. It would not take you a long time before you understand certain medical terms that you come across. So it will give you an edge. Another thing which you need is the ability to write well and also have a good command of grammar. I tell people writing, most times writing is not a talent, writing is a skill. 
And just like every other skill, you can sit down and learn how to write. Nobody is born knowing how to write, but through diligence, through persistence, you can sit down and learn how to write. So if you write well already, well, you tick one of the boxes of becoming a health writer. You also need to have a good command of grammar, knowing what words to use at certain point in time, knowing synonyms you can use so that repetition doesn't come in. So all these things are essential for you to become a health writer. Another point is your ability to conduct in-depth research. You do not write health content by just going to Google and typing what is malaria, then copying and pasting the first article that comes up. It doesn't work that way. That is not research-based. You are just plagiarizing. So you need to be able to conduct research. There are medical databases online where medical articles, medical research, which have been undergone worldwide, you can have access to this research. All you have to do is to be able to use your keywords wisely and to access these platforms. Now, some of these platforms include PubMed, Medline, and even the use of Google Scholar with the right keywords will give you valuable insights. And like Nifem said earlier, the first thing you would need to become a health writer is a solid portfolio. If I come and meet you and tell you I write and I cannot show proof that I write, then it, it wouldn't, I, I, I shouldn't be surprised if you do not believe that I write. I shouldn't be surprised if you are not willing to pay money to me to help you write. So you need a solid portfolio, a portfolio that shows that, okay, yes, I can write. And these are articles which I have written. It doesn't have to be an article for a client because like we know, when you are starting out, you basically might not have any clients. So you might have to write on things that interest you, things that catch your attention. And gradually this could form pieces of your portfolio. And basically since this is a writing um, webinar, some of our points could intersect. And that's the same thing with the next one, which is your willingness to next up with fellow professionals. You're right. Yes, we know you're right. How many other people know that you're right? How many fellow writers do you know? How many fellow writers know you? And um, in this case, you need to network, make use of your social media platforms. You don't have to be bantering all around the timeline and all that because that same social media network which you are using to ban that is what others are using to make money. So all stopping you from making the same money that others are making. So one platform which I would encourage you to utilize as a writer, not just a health writer, is LinkedIn. LinkedIn gives you access to executives. It gives you access to a lot of people from various countries. So Still on networking, you could also join relevant associations. There are health writer groups which you can join and um, you meet fellow health writers where they share resources which are helpful enough. When you also network, you are open to collaborations. You are open to mentorships. I've been able to link up with certain people and um, help them work all because it is obvious that I write health content. I am here today because of a referral. If I hadn't put myself out there, surely I wouldn't get that referral. And um, still back to the portfolio, with regards to your portfolio, you could start a blog, though blogging isn't a piece of cake, but you could start a blog. You can also look for web that accept guest posts. There are certain websites that people are willing to write for them. What they give you in return is exposure. Probably they could be a byline, maybe this article, three things to know about malaria, written by Adebo Ali Belu. So they could give you something like that where your name comes along with the article so that once you show someone else, the person can truly believe that you wrote the article. So 
you could look for websites that accept guest posting. And we'll also discuss some more about that later. Then you can also volunteer. You can also volunteer. Volunteering is one very good way to get exposure, to get experience as a health writer. Though you might not get paid, but at least you are learning on the job and it would be a source of difference. You would, at least you are not idle compared to someone who is just claiming to be a health writer without anything. When you volunteer, when you work on certain pieces of content, you are not idle and you have something to show for it. So let's look at how you can leverage on the opportunities which are found in health writing. One major way which has probably taken us by storm since the COVID pandemic is the um, freelancing. I freelance, which means that I get to pick clients whom I work with and I get to decide how many projects I want to work on and at the time it is convenient. That's the value. Mm -hmm. I thought that's the meeting already. It's going nowhere. Eh, uh, what up? Eh, uh, I don't join. Okay. Me, don't join. Hi, uh, uh, nurse, welcome. Thanks, Lee. Please, uh -huh. unmute yourself. Thank you. So, continuing, freelancing is a beautiful way which you can leverage on the opportunities in health writing. It offers you the flexibility of, like I said earlier, choosing your own clients, choosing who to work with, choosing how much work you want to do, choosing what clients you want to work with. You have the flexibility as well to take on clients which you prefer and to also discard clients which maybe stress your life out and, and all that. And with regards to freelancing, we are not talking just five hour and up work. They are freelance platforms though, but that is not where we are focusing on when we talk about opportunities in health writing. We are focusing on you making use of your social media platforms, making use of your Twitter, your LinkedIn, your Facebook. These platforms like um, Nick Femi said earlier, you will need to gain exposure. People need to know that you are right and showcasing yourself out on this platform would attract the audience of people and possibly someone could be interested in your work and reach out to you. There are several people who have had experiences like that. I also have had several experiences like that where because of the content I put out, the client reaches out to me and is impressed and wants to work with me. So make use of your social media platforms wisely, keyword wisely. And also online job boards are there as well. These are um, websites which collect freelancing jobs. They collect freelancing jobs so that you can sort through and just apply to the ones which catch your fancy. So you could go online and look for freelancing boards. There are several people who have volunteered to gather these resources, several newsletters which you can join, which give you access to a lot of freelancing opportunities in different niches. If you need specialized niches as well, there are also professionals who gather resources on these jobs on health writing. Then guest blogging is a very good way as well to leverage on health writing. You might think that initially it's just you guest blogging, but opportunities could come from there. I began working with Deadline as a volunteer and all my thoughts were that, okay, let me use this to gather um, a portfolio. Let me get pieces of content here, which I can use to seek another job. But then eventually I got a paid offer from the organization. So like I'm saying, the point here is you never can tell what the founder of the organization, what the CEO, what the HR has in mind 
with regards to you and the content you, you put out. Trust me, if you are a guest blogger for a certain organization and you deliver stellar content, they would not want to let you go. They are also aware that you are just guest blogging, but they would want to keep you on their books, want to keep you with them since they've seen the stellar content which you produce. And um, guest blogging also helps you expand your reach, helps you with exposure. You can bank on the credibility of a certain website and say, okay, I write for this website. Trust me, nobody is going to ask you if they paid you to write for them because that is really not what matters. But at that point in time, the fact that you can proudly share a link to an article which you've written is something that involves you as a health writer. So some websites could contain potential keywords like write for us, um, guest posts, or probably you could see something like submit an article. There could be websites which you visit. If you take note of all these things, there could be a certain page dedicated to people who are interested in writing for them. There could be a certain page for those who are interested in submitting articles. So you could just go on the search engine, go on Google, and could just type maybe mental health blogs accepting guest posts. Google will give you a list of blogs which have the um, keyword of guest post there, which accept guest posts. Google will definitely bring them out. And all that is left is for you to pick which one you are comfortable with and apply to it. Then, um, okay, we've discussed social media. And um, finally, we have code emailing or pitching. Code emailing itself is an app and um, it's not something you can learn in just 30 minutes or less. And so I won't be diving deep into it. But code emailing is basically you going out and reaching out to the prospective clients, offering your service. I am a health writer, probably, okay, using the Flow Health app, for example, let's say you want to write for Flow Health and um, you reach out to the editor of my email. I am a health writer with two years of experience. I have written for this website and this website and this website. And I believe that I can contribute to the content being written at Flow Health. Here is a link to my portfolio. Could we have a 10 minute break chat and Thank you, that's all. You are code emailing. True, code emailing could be disappointing at times. You might basically get no response, but you should remember that all you need is one yes. All you need to cancel out the disappointment of previous clients or disappointment of unreplied emails is just one yes. Without one yes, then you wouldn't even remember that you had several other rejections. And code mailing is also a game of numbers. You don't just message one organization or one brand and be hoping they will get back to you. Nobody is at the emails waiting to reply you. So with that in mind, you have need to have a list. I need to collate a list of potential brands which you would like to work with and reach out to them. You should realize that if you are just starting and you are going in for the big brands, Healthline, WebMD, Mayo Clinic and others, you should realize that your possibility of writing for them is minimal. The chances of you writing for them is minimal. These are top brands. These are brands that are well established. They wouldn't initially go with a new writer like you because those are brands that experienced writers, writers who are well versed in their niches are vying for. So it would pay you to be a big fish in a small pond and go for um, websites or organizations which are not as competitive as others, or websites which do not really have that much share, but are also credible websites. So 
going for this one increases your chances of getting a reply at least, even if you do not get to work together. But since it's a game of numbers, definitely one of them is going to click. So finally, let's consider some helpful writing tips which you might need as a health writer. One of them is for you to know how to format your writing well. I do not know how many of us are engaged already in writing or how many of us after this webinar would want to start writing. But while you write, you need to learn how to format your writing well. What do we mean by formatting? There is a heading one, heading two, heading three, H1, H2, H3. Major topics, just like this one at the top here, you can see that the font size for helpful health writing and the point format your writing where you can see that they are different. Merely looking at it, you know that format your writing well is a point underneath helpful health writing tips. That is what formatting does to your articles. It makes it clear that, okay, this point stands alone. This other point is under this point or this point is above this point. So knowing how to format your writing well would give you an edge because nobody, most editors do not have the time to train you on all these things. The, these are the basics of writing and you need to have an idea of all this before going out to seek for people who, would, who you would work for. Another thing in health writing is to be able to use real life examples. Remember that these are people who are reading your articles and if you can relate examples that they can resonate with, they are familiar with, it would engage them the more. They can see that, oh, this thing really does happen. Probably you are discussing about malaria again and um, in your article, you bring up a scenario whereby someone comes to the village and all that then over there he got healed because of malaria people can relate with that because yeah you could travel to another town not knowing how the mosquito uh, species are there and you could get infected by malaria it is things that people see it is things that people experience so using real life examples in your health content will make it more engaging and people can relate with you more then there is the use of visual aids. If you work for bigger brands, you might not be the one to create these visual aids yourself. But if you are still starting out, you could try your hands at some of these visual aids, such as pictures, uh, memes, and diagrams, and several other things which can help to simplify the message you are passing across. So, these visual aids are very important because they help to give your reader a break from reading the whole text. If I give you a 3,000 word article to read and you first scroll to the bottom and see that everything is text, you would likely not want to go through that article. Even though the article might benefit you, but because it's just looking all text and no break in it, it would not interest you enough to go through it. So using visual aid is very important as a health writer. Another major thing which you can implement is being able to provide actionable steps. Being able to provide actionable steps. You might have gone on Google to search maybe how to prevent malaria, how to prevent cholera. When you're searching how to prevent something, you do not need somebody just telling you cholera is a disease caused by vibrio cholerae and all that. You need something specific, something to tell you what to do. And if you see an article that tells you, okay, here is a step-by-step -step way to prevent cholera, you will definitely click on that article because that is the type of content you are looking for. So as a health writer, you need to provide actionable steps for your reader, let the reader see that, okay, if I want to live a healthier life, if I want to get better, if I want to prevent this, these are the steps 
I should follow. It makes them more engaged with you and also builds your brand as an authority in the health niche. Because when I click on a certain website and I see that, okay, this website is helpful and I have another issue again and I come back and the same website is helpful. When I have an issue the third time and I come back, I will be keeping an eye out for that website because I know the previous times I needed help, the website was there for me. So it builds that credibility in the minds of your readers. Then another point is for you to be adaptable or to use inclusive language. Being adaptable means that you are able to write content for various types of clients. You would not always write the same type of content. You can write articles at times, you can write blog posts, you can write presentations as a health writer. So being adaptable means that you are not stuck and maybe writing just blog posts. No, you are versatile enough to write other pieces of content related to your health niche. Now, with regards to using inclusive language, let me um, give you an example. People, um, okay, you say Mary is suffering from diabetes. That doesn't show empathy. That statement doesn't show empathy. It doesn't show concern. It doesn't show compassion. When you say someone is suffering, it's, it's kind of a very strong word and it could discourage a person who is trying to check out this diabetes which has been worrying her. When you say Mary is suffering from diabetes. But as a remedy to that, if you say Mary is living with diabetes, that makes more sense. That shows that, okay, diabetes is not a death sentence. It shows that it is possible to live with diabetes. So in this way, the way you put your words, the way you frame your words would help your reader see if you are empathetic enough to them, your reader can sense your concern, can sense your care. And um, it's very important to use inclusive language which keeps your reader reading your articles. And I would like you to have a look at this, which is why I put it last. It is on using plain language, plain language. Plain language is the language you and I are speaking right now. No big grammar, no need to check the dictionary. You understand what I am saying and I can also understand you. So plain language is general language which everyone uses. So in health writing, your reader needs to be able to understand you and as such, you should use plain language. Use words that he is familiar with, use words that she is familiar with, words that are common to them. So that once they read it, they do not need to be searching for the meaning of this word, the meaning of this word. And if you happen to maybe need to um, write a medical term, it would be wise to explain such a medical term because the reader is not a health professional. So explaining such term would help. For example, you could have the etiology of autoimmune disorders involves intricate interactions between genetic predisposition, environmental triggers, and dysregulated immune responses. If I ask any of you who is not in the health niche the meaning of these statements, I doubt you guys would know because it is not words that you are familiar with. You might be able to make a guess if you are familiar with certain things there, but the certainty that you would be 100% correct to interpret this statement is not there. On the other hand, if you use something like autoimmune disorders develop due to a combination of genes, environmental factors, or impaired immune responses, definitely your reader understands what you are talking about because these are words that are broken down, they are simplified, they are easy to understand words. So I believe you can see why it's important to use plain language as a health writer. You are trying to communicate with your reader, not to confuse your reader. And plain language is key in communicating with your reader. So um, I believe that is the end of my path. Thank you for listening. And um, I'll be handing over to Yabo for 
any other questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you please exit the screen sharing? Okay, thank you so, so much. Um, Adepo Wale Belo for that powerful session. We really appreciate you. It was a powerful one and I benefited from listening and uh, following what you were saying. Please, if we have questions, let's put them in the chat box or we can raise up our hands to ask. Questions, please. But if we are okay, we can also put in the chat box, we are okay. Questions, please, or express your appreciation in the chat box. Please, we are waiting for you. So we can move on because our time is just running. Okay, so in the absence of questions, I would like to say a big thank you to Ajebo Wale. I, 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 I won't lie, I benefited from that presentation. Thank you. So Jeremiah Peacock says, very impressive class. Thank you, Adebo Wale. So the whole of House of Wisdom says, thank you. God bless you and we wish you success in your future endeavors. We hope that very soon we'll have an opportunity to co uh, collaborate further. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so um, we are moving on with our program. So the next speaker is going to be Joshua Agaba. Before he starts talking, I want to say some things about him shortly. Uh, Joshua is a junior tech SEO specialist and freelance content writer for SaaS and tech brands. He creates customer-focused content to help SMEs build organic web traffic and increase online visibility. With four years of experience, he has garnered several certifications from Google, SEMrush, Blue Array, and Udemy. And he, his works can be seen on Engage Bay, Hacker Noon, Lead Digital, ETC. He crafts content that fulfills search intent and improves the site's EAT, focusing on content optimization, keyword research, content strategy, and topical authority. He provides working strategies to generate and promote helpful content in the digital space. When he's not writing, he's carrying out several SEO tests and experiments on websites to improve page rankings and online visibility. We warmly welcome Joshua to the House of Wisdom platform to teach us how to get into B2B writing. Joshua, you have the floor. Joshua, can you hear us? Joshua, can you hear us? Okay, please hold on, please. Let me just see if I can call him. Please hold on.
Okay. Okay. He's having a network issues. So let's see how he's able to sort that out. I will. I'll Can you hear me now? Floor. Or is he with us? Joshua, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, welcome. Okay, sorry about that. I think it was a leak. So let me confirm it. go with this so i will start sharing my screen now um if you can see the screen you can just let me know sorry about the delay i'm having little network issues over here so it's really amazing we can see your screen now okay and you can also hear me right yes we can can you still hear me sorry we can hear you i can hear you i don't know about others okay okay thank you thank you very much thank i just wanted to be sure so i, I can also hear you loud and clear Okay, thank you, you very, very, very much. much. Thank you very much. I just want to show I will not be speaking to myself. Okay, so based on the topic that she has asked me to talk on, which is how to get into B2B freelance writing. Um, before I go into this topic, I would want us to understand that the B2B freelance writing industry is very, very broad and it's not something you can do in a day. It's not something you can do in a week. It's not something you can even do in a month. So it takes time. And so I'll just compress everything into this few minutes that we have. So um, I'll just be giving the basics. I won't go into deep because, like I said, it's very, very broad. You can't cover everything in one day, one week, and even one month. So everything I'll be giving here is just the basics. So um, I'll be starting now. OK, so the first is what is B2B freelance writing. I'm sure we have heard of this. It is not the first time we're hearing about B2B freelance writing. So it's a combination of B2B freelance and writing. B2B is business to business. It's not like. Um, um business to a company like so if you're b2c which is business to companies is like um okay let's say the company sells let me use something that is very very popular let's say a a hair cream um a drug or any of these things that you know that we use and consume on a daily basis or so so if you're writing for this kind of company that is b2c but if you're writing for business to business or you're writing for um, let's say a manufacturer is selling um, cars, and so your uh, and they sell those cars to another company that would sell that car. So it, it, the, the definition is a bit complex, anyways. But I don't want to go too deep into it. But it's just business to business and freelance writing. You will know what freelance is. Freelance is um, basically I'm looking for a very simple word that would be easier and you understand. So. You're not tied to a company. Let me use it that way. You're not tied to an establishment. You're not tied to anyone. So you're freelancing your way. It's not like an in-house where you um you are bound with you are you are you are like a normal nine to five worker or you are a normal kind of worker that is tied to that company. As a freelancer, you can leave anytime you want, you can come in anytime you want. Um, and then writing, writing is something that we all know. So let me just go to the definition of B2B writing. Sorry, I'm trying to be very fast. I'm just trying to cover up so many things within this few time we have, okay? Just bear with me, please. So B2B writing focuses on producing content for other companies, not to the final consumer. Okay, I already explained this. If well executed, this can be a valuable element in a successful B2B marketing strategy. Okay, I just copied this definition from this website that I listed down here. Now I'll be going down to the next. So how to get into B2B freelance writing? Um, like I said, I'll just be doing the basics. I wouldn't go too deep into this. Now, if you want to go into B2B freelance writing, it's very easy to say that you want to start making money, you want to start getting clients, you want to start doing this, you want to grow, you want to be big, you want to be vast, you want to be um, um, on top of the industry and all of that stuff. Uh, what I would like to tell people is that you'd have to, first of all, learn the basics. 
that is the thing you need. If if you're if you're if you're getting into any establishment, you'd have to learn the basics. If you're starting any business, you have to learn the basics. If you want to be a car dealer, you have to learn the basics. You have to know what a car is. You have to know different um, types of cars. You have to learn this. You have to learn that. So if you're going to B two B freelance writing, you don't have to just jump into and say, okay, where are the clients? I need to start making money. It doesn't work that way. So you need to since it's about writing. What is writing? The basics: spelling, capitalization punctuation, sentence structure, grammar usage, AME is American English, BRE is Br British English. So spelling, um, I understand that many of us, um, we know English and we did all of all these things. And sometimes, um, especially, I don't want to be a bit biased, but especially from the background that many of us came from, um, I, 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 I want to believe that everyone here is an African. That's what I want to believe. So you know that English is not really our, um, it may not be the, the base language. So writing in a language that is not yours can be a bit um, challenging. So you, this is why you have to learn the basics and learn it very well because you're not writing for, um, um, you're not basically writing for Africans. You're not, even if you're writing for Africans, and so English is more like a, a common language that everyone will have to know. And it's not just the normal English that you know. It's the English that will have to be. I'm just trying to be basic here so that you would know what this writing is all about. The speakers that I've spoken before now have done a great job. Um, I was listening about the academic writing and the health writing, which is very, very wonderful. They've given almost everything that I, I actually wanted to share. So capitalization, punctuation, sentence structure, grammar usage, AME and BRA, all of these things are very, very necessary. As little as a punctuation issue, as little as a sentence issue, as little as a grammar usage, these things can actually affect your entire writing. American and British English, they are entirely different things. If you're writing for an American audience, you can't use British English. Yeah, there's, a, there's a difference between the boot of a car and the trunk of a car. They are the same thing. The boot and the trunk, they are the same thing. But one is for American and the other is for British. There's a difference between pants and trousers. They are the same thing. But one is for American and the other is for British. So you should understand there's a difference between center with the R-E and center with the E-R. You understand that these things are different. So if you're writing for an American audience, you understand the kind of words that Americans use. For check, um, the kind of check we know, like money check, stuff like that. The British will spell it with Q-U-E, and the Americans will spell it with the E-C-K, it ends in C-K. So all of these things are just basics, but you have to understand them and know that, okay, if I'm writing for this particular audience, this is how I would write it. If I'm writing for this other particular audience, this is how I would write it. You don't mix it up because you're writing for your readers. You're not just writing for yourself. If you understand it and your readers don't understand it, the goal of writing has not been established. Okay. Now, um, you would have to, there's a list of American and British English. Um, it's very, very wide. I can't share that now. So you'd have to, I think with time, you'd get to learn all of all these things. So you'd have to take a list of, okay, which of these things are, which of these is American. You know, we are colonized by the British. So a major, a major um, um, majority of the words we use at British English. So you'd have to learn that, okay, if this is the British side of it, what is the American equivalent of this same word? There are some words that are the same, there are some others that are different. Okay, um, I would go over to the next, which is, now find a niche. Now, after learning the basics, um, the previous speakers have talked about these niches that I, mm -hmm listed here. So in getting into B2B freelance writing, you don't have to, you are not a generalist. Hmm? Um, you cannot write about everything. You would have to find a niche. Find where, it's just like um, after secondary school, we enter university, some say they want to be doctors, some say they want to be lawyers, some say engineers, some say artists, some say um, lab scientists, some say this and that. So it's the same thing with writing. When you come into the writing industry, there are different niches. There are, there are, there are several niches. Um, in finding and identifying your niche, there are so many factors that will be put in place. Um, there are two different types of niches, industry specific, and the other is type of writing. I'll get into the both of them shortly. So industry specific, you have medicine and pharma, you have ed tech, you have SaaS, you have health and wellness. You have artificial intelligence, you have crypto and blockchain, you have the matech. There are so many niches. I just listed this one. Say they are not, they are, they are more than this. There are tons of niches. There is finance niche. There is so um you can basically write about anything. 
anything on earth you can write about it if it's plants you can write about it there's a niche for it so in finding your niche you you, you would you would first of all ask yourself okay what am i passionate about what do i feel like writing what um uh, where do i derive pleasure in um, what industry gives me more joy and stuff like that and also another factor you have to consider is if it's actually a high paying niche because sometimes especially if you're actually doing the writing for um, if you want to use it as a side for Zoom or you want to use it as a full-time role or stuff like that, you'd have to find the one that is high paying. Many of these niche are now obsolete and it's difficult to actually find a high paying um, job with some of these niches. So you'd have to find a niche that is actually high paying. Okay. Um, okay, now I'll move on to the next one. So which is now the type of writing? The first I did was the industry. The type of writing is different from the industry. So the type of writing is content writing, copywriting, video script, ghost writing, press releases, white papers, case studies, so many of them, creative writing, fiction, and all of that. Content writing is different from copywriting. It's different from video script. It's different from ghost writing. You cannot be all of these writers. You can either be a content writer or a copywriter or a video script writer or the one who writes press releases, white paper. Now, I wouldn't go into the nitty gritty and all of these things because they entail a lot. Like I said, it's very broad. So if you want to be a content writer, what and what will it take for you to become a content writer? If you want to be a copywriter, what and what will it take? So there are there, there is there is a whole topic now in each of these niches now. So copywriting now has its own broad topic. Press release, white paper, all of them, there, it's, it's a whole big topic on its own that I would not want to go into now because of time. So now, when you say find a niche, this is what I mean now. I'm going back now. Imagine you are um, a health writer. Uh, and you move to the type of writing. Informational, say you're a health writer and you also a content writer. Health now in the industry and content writing, meaning the type of writing, meaning you would write informational articles about health. But now, if you are a video script writer in that same health writing, meaning that you'll be writing video script for either YouTube videos or webinars or anything video, anything that has to do with video, it is not content writing. Um, I understand that we know that content is everything, of course, but I want I just want you to understand what I'm trying to say now. I don't want to take time to explain all of these things. Now, if you're a copywriter, and let's 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 match many of these niches so that you will understand. If you're if you're a SaaS writer and you are a copywriter, now you would you know what copywriting is, you're trying to promote a product. So imagine there's a SaaS product here. Let's say let's use Zoom as a case study. What a copywriter would do is write um promotional content that will promote um, 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 the users of Zoom and push them to buy. That is the goal of copywriting, to persuade people to buy. But content writing now for a SaaS company will be, okay, this is what this tool does. It does this and it does this. It can help you. Do it's more of informative to an extent. There is, like I said, it's very broad, but I'm just giving a basic, um, a foundational, um, uh, talk on this now. Same with ghost writing, press release, white paper, and all of these things that I've listed here. Now, how can you find your niche? Like I said, you would find an industry specific niche, find the type of writing you're comfortable with, and then match them together. So you can be, you can be, um, a crypto content writer, or you can be. A writer who writes press release for the crypto industry. Um, sorry if your mic is on, you can mute it. I'm getting my feedback. So if you're in the MarTech industry, you can be um, a writer who writes case studies for the MarTech industry. Now, it actually takes time to find your niche and be balanced in whichever one you feel secure. What I would advise is you get a list of these niches hmm, and try to be general with them. Just try to do a lot of them. And then with time, you would, you would be niche specific. You would narrow down your search because it's very difficult for you to now say, okay, I'm actually SaaS. 
I'm actually healthy, especially if you're starting new, because you may not know what this niche entails, what this niche entails. If you don't have a background idea, I'll suggest that you go general at first and say, okay, let me try medicine, let me try SaaS, let me try health and wellness, let me try crypto, let me try AI. So if I find out that, okay, medicine didn't work for me, you cross out medicine, health tech didn't work for me, that's how you cross it out once you find the one that's your perfect fit. Now, going down, you can try, okay, let me try content writing, let me try copywriting, let me try press release, let me try white papers and all of that stuff. And then you, with time, you find out the one that is best suited for you. When I started, I started out with ghostwriting. Then I found out that ghostwriting wasn't my thing. And then I entered copywriting. Copywriting wasn't my thing and before I settled for content writing. So I found out that with time, you can um, switch and transition from one form of writing to another form of writing. Now, it is very possible that you can do all of these things. The only thing is that you may not be efficient, just like they say, jack of all trade, master of one and stuff like that. You may not be efficient. You can be efficient in one or two or three of them. Okay, there is no limits to anyone you want to do. But if you want to be um like how do I put this now? If you want to be a a um an industry leader, you would have to be specific now in in this search. Sorry, I'm taking time in this session. I just want us to understand it very well because if you find your niche, that is how you can now understand your your scope of writing very well. Because you cannot be writing about medicine and then you'll be putting the, the knowledge of medicine in SaaS or the knowledge of medicine in crypto. These things are interrelated, actually. But for you to be an effective writer, you need to have holistic knowledge about crypto and blockchain for you to be a blockchain writer. Okay, you cannot use the knowledge of crypto and add to medicine. So the time you use to study medicine, study edtech, study SaaS, study health, and study, so it takes time. That's why you have to be specific on one so that if you're following crypto, you follow it to the end. You don't jump from this one and enter this one and enter this one. Okay, that's the importance of finding a niche so that you can be targeted and so you can be directed. Um, I'm done with it. I think I've spent so much time on this niche. So um, the next one, building your skills. Now, um, the bulk of freelance writing is actually building your skills. What many people like to do is they just want to, they just want to enter into writing and start making money. It's not actually how it should be because you may end up ruining your brand. You may end up building a bad reputation for yourself. You may end up um, wasting your clients' money because they will spend money for something and you bring bad work. And many times they may not even ask you to refund. So it's more like you have created a bad image. Now in building yourself, there are so many tips. I just gave one, two, three, four, five, six. I just gave six, there are so many of them, okay? Now, the first one is stay updated on current trend. Um, the writing industry in 1997 is not the same with the writing industry now. So many things have happened. So many things have changed. So many things are coming up. So many things are going down. So if you cannot understand what is happening in the writing industry, you cannot grow faster. It's just like the version of your phone. At times, they will tell you, okay, this version is outdated. Let's update this. Let's update that. It's the same thing with the writing industry. There are so many updates that have happened in the past few months. And if you are not um, up to date, if you're not keeping tabs with what is happening, you may miss out. Okay? So the updates will actually help you understand, okay, this is what is happening in the writing industry. This is the new set of skills that writers will need. These are the new set of um, um, tools that the writers will need to amplify their processes and their strategies. Okay, um, that is all for staying updated on current trends. Now, read, 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 and read. I, I cannot <laughs> emphasize this enough. Um, if you're writing for people to read, that means you have to also be a reader. You cannot just write and say people read what I have written. Why you cannot read other people's work? Now, in reading, the goal of reading is to actually understand how other persons write. Number one. Number two, understand your industry very well. Now, if you're a SaaS writer, what is the SaaS industry all about? You have to understand that what and what is in this SaaS industry. What are the sub niches in this SaaS industry? So in reading all of all these things, you, you broaden your horizon and you, you widen your scope of knowledge and you get to understand things more. You get to understand your industry more. So when you read, you you are fast so that when you are discussing with your clients or when you're writing it, it's very simple um let's say for example for example you are giving a comprehension 
um, uh, we used to do English comprehension then in primary school. And so they would say, okay, read this comprehension, write an essay about it. You cannot write about something you have not read. It's the same with exam. If you're writing an exam, they will say, okay, read this and read that, read that for this question. If you're writing the question, you would have to write the question based on what you have read. So if you have not read, you cannot write. Okay. Join a community of writers, especially in your niche. Uh, you cannot grow in isolation. You'd have to find a community of writers, people who share the same value with you. Now, when I say especially in your niche, is because because of the first um, because of the first point, stay updated on current trends. Now, you cannot have all the knowledge to yourself. There are some writers who are um, who are experts in certain aspects in writing, and there are some who are experts in other who, who are experts in other aspects. So, joining a community of writers will help you share insights, share the knowledge, and um, build together so that you would, um, if one has an idea and say, okay, hey. I have an idea about this. What do you think? You discuss, you share ideas. What do you think about this style of writing? What do you think about this style of writing? Here's my writing. Could you please go through it and see where the mistakes I made? Uh, what are the things I did not do right? What are the things I need to correct? What are the things I need to improve? So a community of writers would help you um, um, support your errors on time so that you don't grow in isolation. Because if you grow in isolation, your journey will be very long. You would take more time and make more mistakes. What is content marketing? Okay, this one now, you'd have to understand what content marketing is in building your skills. Remember what we're talking about is how to build your skills as a writer. We've talked about the basics. Now, building your skills also talks about those basics I listed, capitalization, punctuation, and all of those things. You'd have to build your skills and all of those things. What is content marketing? You need to know how content marketing will affect your, um, your writing career. So it's not just about writing. So how can you... Um, this thing is very broad. I'm trying to find the right words to. Okay, so now you have written this piece. How can you market it and share it to a wider audience? That's just it. So if you're a writer, you need to also understand content marketing. Okay, so that you will understand how your content can impact your readers. I wouldn't go too far into that. Always learn something new. Like I said from the beginning, stay updated on the current trends. Don't just stay idle. Okay, so many things are happening even as I speak. So many things are happening in the content marketing industry. And so you have to be on top of the trend. You have to be on the news. You have to know what is happening. So that if you're writing something, you would know the current strategies that you would use and you will know the strategy that you would have to um, um, abandon. Because there are things that you would write now and someone would think like, okay, where are you coming from? Are you coming from Pluto? Where have you been 10 years ago? So you would have to understand Learn something new. That's just it. Always learn something new. Don't, don't, um, don't be stagnant. Always research. Always ask questions. Always research. Always ask questions. Follow top writers is the same thing with join a community of writers. Follow top writers. Don't just stay idle. Find people who are making it in the industry. Don't bug them. Okay. Don't bug them. They are busy people. But you can follow them through their posts. You can follow them through whatever that they are sharing. These things would help you grow. Mm -hmm. You would learn from their mistakes. You would learn from their experiences. You would learn from their tests and their experiments. You would learn from the, uh, the case studies that they are bringing out. So if they try this strategy and they fail, they come and share it and say, okay, this is what I tried and it failed. You now see that they have tried it. You don't need to try it again because they have already tried it. So it's like they're making the work easier for you. They bring up strategies, they bring up tips, they bring up techniques that would help you build your skills. That's why I said the, the, the um, heading for this slide is building your skills. All of these things will help you build your skills. There are so many more, but I wouldn't want to go too far. Um, the next one, treating writing as a business, not as a hobby. Um, this one is actually a whole, it's, it's a whole topic on its own. If you're treating your writing as a hobby, then maybe you don't want to earn from it. Uh, maybe you can just do it for the fun of art, maybe because you love the words and you want to do it for aesthetics and maybe something that would not require stress or something like that. I hope you understand. If you're doing this as a business, you would have to develop a, financial, um, a, a strategy for marketing yourself online. 
like I said, all of all these things are just compressed. Mm -hmm. This is a this is another broad stuff on its own. Develop a strategy for marketing yourself online. Developing a strategy for this is that you will first of all pick what you feel would be necessary for your growth. I chose LinkedIn. I was on Facebook, but I decided to leave Facebook and then I focused on LinkedIn. Okay. Now, um, if you find a strategy that would help you grow, you would develop, you would build on that strategy as long as it's working for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I wouldn't go too much into that. No time. And then set realistic financial goals. Realistic. Realistic financial goals. You don't just say, I want to earn 1 million every month. And it's not very realistic. Okay. So you would ask yourself, okay, how many clients do I have in a month? Um, how many of them do I work with? How much should they pay me? How do I plan to scale up? How do I plan to do this? And how do I plan to do that? Okay. So setting these realistic financial goals would, one, help you plan your financial life. And know how you can manage your money and your finances. Because one thing I will tell you is that the freelance life, like I started in the beginning, is not the same as the in-house. Um, it's not the same as the in-house writing. As an in-house writer, you are in a company. And at the end of every month, you're expecting a salary until you leave that company. But as a freelancer, you are not tied actually to any company because you can actually go and come out at any time. Your clients can leave you at any time. They can just give you a one month contract and you finish that contract and that's all. They can give you a six month contract and you finish that contract and that's all. So if you don't set realistic financial goals and plan your financial life, there are days in a freelancer's life where they may not have any clients at all. There are days where their clients would, maybe because the clients have run out of their budgets or um, they have no need for content at that period or they are no longer need they, they no longer need your services again. There are so many reasons. Okay, so if any of these reasons hits you, maybe your clients have run out of their finance um, their content marketing budget, and they say, okay, we can no longer work with you at this point because we don't we no longer have enough money to fund your content needs. Uh, so we'll have to give it a break. What would you do at that moment if you have not set financial goals? Okay, so you'd have to set your financial goals and make sure that you're financially intelligent. These things are very broad, uh, so that at those moments where you are no longer working, mm -hmm. the money that you have saved before will help you and sustain you pending till the time you encounter another client again. That's all. Then apply for gigs on job boards or send pitches. I think the previous speakers have already done um done a good job on this one. Apply for gigs. Don't just sit back and hope that mana will fall from heaven. It won't fall from heaven, okay? So you'd have to apply, go out there, um, I think the first speaker was talking about creating a portfolio and stuff like that. You'd have to also do that. You have to create portfolio, uh, build your samples, and all of those things. It's, these things are very, very broad. Apply for gigs on job board. 10 pitches. 10 pitches. Okay. I wouldn't go too much. Then build your network. The first speaker was also talking about building network and building a very strong network, which is the same thing I also talked about when I said um, join a community of writers and follow top writers. You don't have to. You cannot grow in isolation okay so you have to build a network people who can refer you to um now in building your network you should understand that you should understand that um there are on I, I don't know how to put it now but the jobs are many that's just what i want to say now the jobs are many you cannot count them they are uncountable if i should put it that way the only problem is positioning if you have not positioned yourself in a place where the job we will look for you. That is where you have a problem. Now, in building your network, you can now connect yourself to people who need the job. The problem is that people are actually looking for workers, people are actually looking for content writers, but they cannot find them. This is where positioning comes in, and this is where building your network comes in. Okay, if you can build your network to the point where, okay, I am networking with people who know those people who are looking for writers. If they can ask, okay, do you know anyone in your network who is looking for writers? Because I have positioned myself and I have networked myself so good, it would help me and the person who is referring me trust me and know that, okay, I trust you to someone else. That's why you have to build your network, okay? And then building your skills. It's the same thing I said in the last slide. Before you build your network or as you're building your network, you should also build your skills so that those who are 
um, anticipating your work will trust you and they will they will trust you and believe in whatever you have to offer to them. I cannot refer you to something Thanks, and at the end of the day uh, it will be... sorry I don't know could it be turn off your microphone or something Right. So, like I said about building your skills, um, you just have to build your skills. I would not. Um, the next point, the next point, which is the last, um, like I said, this is very broad. I don't want to go into deep into all of all this. Stuff. I just want to touch different areas so that you would understand the basics. Any of these areas that you're deficient in, you would go into it and work on it, okay? Now, the four major writing pages, which is the last, and uh, that's the last slide, right? Yeah, that's the last. So the four major writing pages, which are researching, outlining, writing, and editing. Now, you build your skill, you network with people, you've done your homework and you've done everything. And now you are, they have given you a contract or a gig and they say, okay, write on this, write on that. How would you go about it? There are so many things you'd have to consider. There are so many factors you'd have to consider. I've compressed it under this four, which is researching, outlining, head writing, and editing. Now in researching, I'll take for example, let's say, the the prompt was write about a phone, a mobile phone, a smartphone. Now, imagine you don't know anything about the smartphone, or even if you know something about the smartphone, you don't know everything about the smartphone. This is where researching comes. You cannot just jump to the writing stage and start writing. Okay? If they say write about a smartphone, you first of all research. Find facts, find statistics, find data about smartphone. What is a smartphone? what is the importance of a smartphone, at least get that because it will be easier to write about something you know about than writing something about something you don't know about. So for you to write about a smartphone or a bicycle, you have to research, okay, okay, what is this and what is that so that you would understand. Now, the next is outlining. Every blog post has a structure. Every content, every, every, every um, article has a structure. Outlining gives you the structure. It's more like the skeleton of the content. So outlining, you're like, okay, what will be in the H1 tag? What will be in the H2 tag? What will be in the H3 tag? What will be in this tag? What will be in this place? What will be in this place? So you can, okay, if it's, what is, if, if you're writing about the smartphone, the structure can be the headings, okay? It's like the top to bottom approach of how you're going to run that content. So you can start with what is a smartphone, benefits of a smartphone, types of smartphone, all of these headings that you would do in the content, that is what is outlining, basically. That's just the background and fun, foundational idea about outlining. Um, let me just rush time. Time is not on our side. The next is writing. After outlining, you now have a framework of how your content would look like. Now you start writing on those, on those framework which you have set. <laughs> Um, so you are like, what is a smartphone, which is the first outline you made. You write what is a smartphone. Benefits of a smartphone, you write under it. This, you write under it. Types of smartphone, you write under it. So these are, this, now the last stage is editing stage. Now you have written your first draft and everything you need to write. Editing is now would help you cut out the excesses and all of those things which are not needed in the writing, um, in course of all those things you have written. Because when you're writing, you may not know the mistakes and errors which you are making. So the editing part would help you refine your writing and make it readable for your audience. Um, I think that's all about getting into basic freelance writing. This is this was a very very basic, like I said, like I said, it's very 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 basic. But I just wanted you to have a little idea about what it entails. Okay, you can never learn it in a day. There are so many and so many things that. Even in researching alone, you understand how to research the places you need to research to get your sources, outlining how to outline, writing how to write. So all of these things are broad in themselves. So we'll not have to go deeper and deeper into each of them. I think I'll just stop here for now. Yeah, okay. Sorry.
Okay, thank you, Joshua, for that powerful session. He was enjoy. Please, can you exit the screen sharing for us? Yeah, I will. I will. I will do that now. I will. Are you done? Sorry, okay, yeah, I'm done. Thank you so much for that powerful session. It was enjoyable to follow. We appreciate you. And uh, we would like to ask for questions. Questions, questions. Please, if you have questions, let us know in the chat box or raise up your hand. Or if you want to appreciate our speaker, please put it in the chat box for us to read it out. Please, let's go ahead and appreciate him. This has been a fantastic session. This has been a fantastic session. Please, let's put our questions in the chat box. I would like to use this opportunity to thank Joshua for, for coming through, for coming through for us this afternoon. I enjoyed listening to him, and I hope that the knowledge will help participants today and those that will watch the video on YouTube to also get into B2B writing. So we really appreciate you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the energy. Thank you for the knowledge you have shared this afternoon. My God will reward you. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a question. Uh, we, okay, so Emmanuel Michelia says, thank you very much, Mr. Joshua. We are so appreciative of your sacrifice this afternoon. Thank you so, so much. Okay, because of our time, let me quickly just talk about how to overcome imposter syndrome. We are, we are done. We are almost done. Just for a few minutes, we'll soon be out of here. I chose to talk about this because freelance writers face it. I faced it when I started. I'm not going to sit here and lie about it. And, uh, okay, uh, Mr. Jeremiah Peacock says, his session was brief and basic. It creates an introductory tunnel. Thanks, boss. We will need Mr. Joshua to come again to teach us more. I, I believe he's listening to us. And when we reach out to him, he will definitely oblige us. Okay, so let me quickly talk about imposter syndrome and uh, how I have dealt with it in practical terms, because I don't believe in talking all this theory. I'm going to tell you what I've done, and you can also borrow from it or, or, or whatever. Okay, so the term imposter syndrome was created by two American psychologists in 1978. Their names are Colin Clance and Suzanne Imes. And basically, imposter syndrome refers to a situation where you are doubting yourself. It, it's a situation where you, you have self-doubt, as in you don't believe you can do it. And, and so you are in this spot where a client has reached out to you and you are doubting your capabilities. Hey, should I take this job? What if I'm disgraced? What if I'm found out to be a fraud? What if I'm found out to be a cheat? There are ways to deal with it. Ah, but one thing I want you to know is you are not alone. That's the honest truth. And, and that is why I said I have personally experienced it. Uh, I, and it comes with the feeling of, okay, they've approached you. Okay, tell us your, your rates. And you are devaluing your efforts. You don't even know how to charge well. So basically, that is how it plays out. And like I said, you are not alone. Maya Angelou, yes. Maya Angelou, the prize-winning author. 
after publishing her 11th book, said that every time she wrote, she would think to herself, who, who, they are going to find out now. I've run a game on everybody. She felt that sense of doubt about her activities. And then Michelle Obama, the former first lady, has spoken and written about how Sorry, so the form, sorry about that. The former first lady has spoken and written about how as a young woman, she used to lie awake at night asking herself, am I too loud? Am I too much? Am I dreaming too big? Eventually, she said she got tired of always worrying what everyone else thought. And she said to herself, I decided not to listen to anybody. And so I'm just saying this for you to know that you are not alone. Especially when you get onto this uh, writing thing and then, like, let me tell you the story of my own journey. When I started, I had this uh, mentor who said, okay, do cold email pitches. Cold email pitches, which means I was going to send them emails to promote my service without knowing them. And I needed to develop that sense of belief in my capability to be able to promote myself through emails. And then what did I do? I engaged the spiritual. I won't lie to you. Because I believe business is spiritual. I believe everything is spiritual. The spiritual controls the physical. The spiritual controls the natural. And so I told God, I said, God, help me. I cannot do this thing alone. I need your backing every step of the way. And you know, when you play songs like Victoria Orange's I Get Backing, they give you a sense that, yes, I'm not alone in this thing. Somebody is with me. I, I, I have support. And, and so that was the first thing I did. I engaged the spiritual. Secondly, I worked on my mindset. You need to sit yourself down. You need to psych yourself up. You know how we have meetings with other people, like we are having a meeting now? Sit yourself down. Have a meeting with yourself and tell yourself, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. Tell yourself the people that are doing it are not better than me. They don't have two heads. Like Adekule Gold sang, Dangote Odorimeji. And it's the truth. He has one head like you and I. And look at what he has achieved. Today, he has a refinery where the government doesn't have. A whole nation does not have it. But he's an individual and he has it. So you have to sit yourself down and tell yourself, if others can do it, I can do it. Like when I got into the B2B space, I had to tell myself, if Chima Mede is doing it, I can do it. If Lili Ubaja is doing it, I can do it. These are all B2B top writers, and they are Nigerians. And they work from Nigeria. At least at the time I started, Chima was still in Nigeria, but she's moved to the UK now. But Lili Ubaja is still here. She's in Onicha. And they are top right. So I have to sit myself down and tell myself, if these people are doing it, I can also do it. So that's the second thing I did. I worked on my mindset. Mindset is very powerful. It is what you tell your mind that your mind will follow. If you tell your mind, I can't do it, so be it. Your mind won't challenge you. But if you tell your mind, I can't do it, he will follow you. And so change your mindset. Work on it. Psych yourself up. Sit down and say, uh-uh. If this person can do this thing, I can also do it. It's not strange. I can do it. The third thing I did was... I decided to go for it. 
I put in my all. I decided to go for it. As in, I was no longer going to give myself excuses. I decided to go for it. And which means I sat down, I wrote my cold email pitches, and I started sending them. People I never knew from anywhere. I'll get their emails uh, through Clairbit, Clairbit, C-L-E-A-R-B-I-T. And I was sending them cold email pitches. And that was how I got my first set of clients in freelance writing. And even at, after that, I got a, a job that made me also doubt myself. Because when I started, I wanted to be writing for company blogs. But a company called High Spot reached out to me. In fact, it, they were the second to reach out to me for that kind of assignment. The first to reach out to me for that kind of assignment was Mail Relay. They are an email marketing platform. So they wanted me to be doing guest blogging for them, which means I was going to write the posts and I will post it on another blog, not on their own blog, which means I had to do outreach. I will email the other blog, make sure they are okay with what I want to write and write for them to publish. And I will link the article back to Mail Relay's website. I'm just telling you this for you to know that I had to do a lot of mindset work for me to be able to do that. Because you are going to publish on somebody else's blog, you have to be able to convince them to take the posts. And your client is expecting you to deliver. Which means you, you have to also come up with ideas that will sell. There's a lot of brain work going on there. And so I, I decided to fight the self-doubt. I told myself I can do it. And you know, you, you don't have any choice to do it, but to do it because you have your why. And for me, my why was I needed something to get going. I needed something to bring in the money. And so that was my why. And so I had every reason to fight my doubts. And so that is the third thing I did. I decided to go for it. I decided to fight the self-doubts. I didn't have anybody doing it around me, but the people that I had met online were enough inspiration for me to follow. And I'll say it every day, is, is one guy that helped me at the beginning of my journey. And that is why I subscribe to Joshua's uh, advice that you follow top writers because they will lead you aright. Now, the next thing I realized, so I've talked about three things. The first thing, engage the spiritual. The second thing, work on your mindset. The third thing, fight the self-doubt. Go for it. It's just like when I talked about overcoming fear. I said, even despite the fact that I feared public speaking, I did it for the first time in my life. My stomach was rumbling. Everything was happening to me. I still got onto that stage because I knew it was pivotal to my life and my destiny. And I wasn't going to allow that fear to hold me down. Just as you should also not allow your self-doubt to hold you down. You should not allow your yeah, imposter syndrome to hold you down. Now, when you now start going for it, some things will go wrong. I'm not going to sit here and tell you everything will go rosy just because you decided to fight yourself down. Your first draft will be terrible. Just take it from me. Just take it from me. Clients who are experienced know this. And so they won't even judge you based on your first draft. They'll just give you uh, comments on what to revise and what to change. So just know that the fact that you submitted a terrible first draft does not mean you should go back and start doubting yourself, right? We are talking practicality here because you have decided to go for it. A client has given you a, a brief and you have worked on it and the client said, ah, this first draft, you have to do a lot of work around it. That does not mean you should go back and start doubting yourself. It means you have to improve. That's just what it means. It means you have to work on yourself more. And that takes me to the next thing I did to help me overcome the spirit of self-doubt and which is to work on myself. 
you have to, and, and Joshua talked about it here. He said, read. I do a lot of reading. And even at that, I still think I don't do enough. I watch YouTube videos. I listen to podcasts. Because you, you, you have to be prepared. You have to know that, yes, I know my onions. As a when clients come, you can deliver. Work on yourself. That will make you what? It will make you uh, develop less self-doubt. It, it will make you confident when you know your onions, when you know what you are talking about. Take courses, do certifications. There are so many free certifications online. SEMrush, HubSpot, so many Google. Do all these certifications. Become a master of your trades. So when you work on yourself, you will develop a lot of confidence. Because of our time, I don't want to waste our time. I'll talk about one last thing. And then, you know, when you look at it and you say, okay, imposter syndrome is self-doubt, will you now allow that self-doubt to stop what you really want to do? You know, if, if something is important for you, you will find a way around it. If something is important for you, you will find a way around it. Like, for me, one thing that has always moved me is this, uh, there is this lady who did a research. Uh, not actually a research, but she did, she, she, she took, she used to take, she's an Australian nurse. And she used to take care of people who are close to dying, like 12 weeks to die. And so she's a palliative nurse. Her name is uh, Bonnie Warrell, so I think so. And so she did this um, interviews with people who were close to dying. And she was asking them, what are their top five uh, deathbed regrets? And you won't imagine what some of them said. The first one said, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. That's the first one. The second one says, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. The third one says, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. The fourth one says, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. The fifth one said, I wish that I had let myself be happier. And so you look at it and you, you, you need to look at the end of your life. If you allow imposter syndrome to stop you from progressing now, what will you feel at the end of your life? Will you be happy with yourself? That is one thing that motivates me daily, that I don't want to get to that end and then look back and say, ah, I regret not doing this. I regret not doing that. I regret not, not working this way. It's a powerful motivator. And I want us to also use it to overcome imposter syndrome. That self-doubt, you can conquer it. You can fight it. Tell yourself, look, I won't be happy with myself or my deathbed if I don't do this thing. And so I'm going to give it my all, no matter what it takes, no matter what I have to give. And that is it. And that is why I tell, I tell people that follow me, even on WhatsApp, I say, we are legacy builders. And legacy builders do not take no for an answer. We fight to the end. That is it. Because God has not created us to be small. It is not in the plan of God for you to be small. But you need courage to overcome self-doubt. And so I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice this evening that the voice of self-doubt will be silenced in your life in the name of Jesus. I pray for everybody on this call tonight and those that will watch the recording that we receive the courage to move ahead with our dreams, our goals, our plans in the name of Jesus. Nothing will stop us. We won't allow the enemy to use self-doubt to stop us because it's a plan from the pit of hell to stop the children of God from progressing. And so the spirit of self-doubt is silenced in our lives in the name of Jesus.
Thank you, Lord Jesus, for such a powerful session. We bless your name, Lord, for DMM 7.0, and we appreciate you for all that are on this call, because this session is going to make a difference in their lives and in their destinies. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And so I want to say a big thank you to everybody on this call who was here from the beginning, even up till now. Look out for DMM 8.0 by the grace of the Almighty. It will also be explosive. Now, I want to say for everybody who is on this call, who is not on our WhatsApp, we have a newsletter that we share every Monday to Friday. And you can get on the newsletter by joining on plus 234 if you are out of Nigeria, 803-356-4055. Plus 234-803-356-4055. We hope to see you in our DM, and I want to say a big thank you. Okay, so Manuel Michela says amen. Jeremiah Peacock says amen. And then Jeremiah Peacock says thanks for the tra uh, practical tips. We appreciate the name of the Lord. Thank you. Does anybody want to say a word or two before we leave? Does anybody want to say a word or two before we leave? Anybody wants to talk? Before we close the class, we will give you the floor. If you want to say a word of appreciation, you want to ask a question, whatever it is, we will give you the floor. Emmanuel Michela says, thank you very much, ma'am. We bless the name of the Lord. Anybody wants to talk? Okay, in the absence of such, we declare DMM 7.0 closed. Okay, we have a, 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 a a comment. Thank you very much, ma'am. I will appreciate if you can give us a list of some of the top Nigerian writers to follow. Okay. So we have Chima Meje. She used to be in Abuja, but she's in the UK now. But it's okay. You can follow her. She's she's down to earth. Uh, Johnny Wazo. He's, he's, he's spoken on our platform before. He's still a... He just passed out of youth service but this guy is making mega books mega books from writing johnny who was all join him and um, okay adi joker says well done ma'am thank you my sister god bless you dr marathi says thank you so much ma. it was quite interesting dr marathi thank you so much for the support i appreciate you she's my pastor in church <laughs> I bless the name of the Lord for the day I met her. She's been so encouraging. God bless you, Ma. Thank you. <laughs> so, Jeremiah Peacock says, Dr. Amarachi, I greet you. <laughs> okay, God bless you. We appreciate it. Okay, so John Wozo and uh, Lily Ubaja, she's top, top there. She's in the chat there, but this is something else. I won't lie to you. Uh, there is also Rosemary Ebo. Rosemary Ebo. If you can DM me on WhatsApp, I will send you more. But these are the ones I can remember off the top of my head. Rosemary Ebo is also there. Uh, Joshua Agaba, who spoke today. Stella Inabo. She spoke last month. Stella Inabo. Uh, there are a couple of others that I can share with you on WhatsApp if you get in touch. So thank you so much. I don't want us to overstretch. We said it's ending by six. Thank you so, so much. Have a fantastic evening. Oh, Nobisi says thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Nobisi, for the support. I appreciate all the people you have been sending to us. We, we have them on our WhatsApp. Thank you so, so much. God bless you for your support. We appreciate you because we, we, we cannot do this alone. We need God and we need people. And we appreciate you all for the support. I want to say a big thank you to Engineer Taiwo Kuye. God knows what we both know. And he will bless you bountifully. Emmanuel Michela, thank you for joining. Emanuela from Uganda, I appreciate you. God bless you. Dr. Amarachi, my team pastor, thank you so much, Ma. Uh, Mr. Nobisi, thank you. 
Mr. Joshua Agaba, I appreciate you. Mr. Samuel Ekele, thank you so much. God bless you so, so much. I appreciate you, Jeremiah Peacock. Thank you. <laughs> My protege, God bless you so, so much. I appreciate you all. Do have a fantastic Sunday evening. Bye. Bye-bye.